my intro slides aren't really important. You can see by the typo right there, uh, it's heat pump space heaters. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly so we can get to Russ's presentation on heat pump space heaters tonight. Uh, first of all, thanks everybody for joining. Um, thank you, Russ and Julie. Um, my name is Callum Damon. I uh, work with the County Marin and the Community Development Agency Sustainability Team. I'm joined with uh, Russ King, who's gonna be our main presenter today, and, and Julie Chu, who's on our team and uh, is a media tech and does our tech support. Uh, so next, uh, or scroll down, or I don't know if it's a button, or there we go. So just a brief Energy 101, and because we're talking about heat pumps, uh, space heating today, I think Russ is gonna get into a lot of this stuff, but just wanna reiterate that, um, you know, there's certain things that we consider really important, uh, like your building shell, especially when, when it comes to the performance of your HVAC system. Um, but even before that, you know, just doing simple things like LED light bulbs, power strips, faucet aerators, uh, we really recommend doing the low to no cost things first and then kind of working your way up to the higher ticket items. You save more money that way. Um, one great example is if, you know, at the end of the, at the end of this energy efficiency journey, if that's what you're on, you know, maybe you already have solar, but let's say you want to get solar at the end of it. Um, if you've uh, reduced your demand enough, you can save money by getting a smaller solar panel. Um, so that's kind of the the idea there. And you just it's just the economic thing. You save more money with um, you know the the cheaper options here. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, need landlords approve. So like some of those things, you know, when we're talking about energy projects in a home. So changing out a light bulb, you don't need your landlord approval for. Um, but changing out your furnace, you probably do. <laughs> so that's what that means. Um, ducts are important. Uh, Russ is going to get into a lot of this, but um, ducts are really important, especially when your HVAC system is uh, concerned. You know, if you have a ducted system, uh, these are just examples of leaky ducts. So if you, you know, have ac visual access to those, I'd recommend, you know, taking a look and seeing the condition of your duct. Um, you know, thinking of your home as a system is, is a great way to go about it. And uh, another bullet point here is to size equipment properly. Um, you know, ask your contractor for low calculations so you're not getting a huge unit, um, you know, to serve your house. And I like this little picture here of, you know, your, the, the money that's escaping and going into your attic and crawl space is, you know, money out the door, right? You're just, you know, basically just heating your attic and crawl space and it's not getting to where uh, you need it to be. So ducts, uh, good good working ducts are important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are just some of the energy efficiency programs, especially concerning the low hanging fruit that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Rising Sun Center for Opportunity has a green house call program where they, they will send you a kit in the mail that has free LED bulbs, uh, faucet aerators, power strips, stuff like that. Um, it's available to everybody, whether you're a renter, owner in an apartment or single family home. Um, and then Home Energy Score is an energy audit program. Um, this is more for single family homes, but uh, the way it works is you have somebody come out and they do an audit of your home and uh, they give you a score that tells you how efficient your house is compared to other size, other similar sized homes. Uh, and the score is one to 10, just to give you an idea. And it also comes with a custom recommendation sheet. So we really recommend that program to folks that uh, just are getting started and um, you know don't know where to start or maybe they just moved in and they're looking to uh, do some energy projects. So that's a good one there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the Bay Ren Home Plus uh, program. So Bay Ren Home Plus offers rebates for energy efficiency and electrification uh, projects for homeowners. Uh, next slide. And then these are some of the other programs, uh, specifically Tech and Electrify Marin that offer rebates for heat pumps. Now, the big distinction here is that um, Tech and Bayren are contractor programs. So contractors need to sign up and able, uh, to be able to offer those rebates to their customers. Um, so there are these contractor directories like the Switches On and the Bayren site where you can look for participating contractors. And, um, so the Electrify Marin program, which is available to everybody in Marin, uh, that does not require a specific contractor. Um, 
we usually just take the applications from homeowners uh, once they're done with their projects. And that can be layered on top of these other rebate programs uh, because it comes from a different funding source. So it gets kind of complicated. We're there to kind of help people walk through this, just to keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, along those same lines, uh, there are some other services like Home Intel and Quick Carbon. Um, which are there to kind of help navigate people through the rebate program landscape and, you know, try to make sure that you're taking advantage of everything that's out there. So I'd encourage looking into those. And then uh, I mentioned before the switch is on is a great directory for contractors that are participating in rebate programs and also finding which rebates, you know, apply to the project you're looking into. Uh, next slide, please. And I just want to put this here, uh, Inflation Reduction Act incentive. Um, right now, the tax credit is available. So that's uh, capped at $2,000 per year. Um, and one thing that uh, to keep in mind is that it's, it's basically four heat pumps, that 25C. And uh, so a lot of people to take advantage of that you know, tax credit and to stay within that cap, they might do their heat pump water heater one year and their heat pump space heater another year. So, and I have a note here, we are not accountants. So please uh, talk to your accountant or tax professional uh, just to make sure that, um, you know, you're able to take advantage of this stuff and, you know, you're keeping within the rules and all that stuff. Um, the IRA rebate is gonna be available sometime in 2024. We do not know exactly when, and we don't know the exact details on how it's going to work yet, um, but it is something pretty significant. Um, you know, for folks that are under 80% of the area median income, there can be up to $8,000 available for a heat, pump, a heat pump space heater. So, you know, if you don't need to replace your unit now, it might be worth waiting for, um, especially if you fall into that uh, income bracket. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Russ. I went through that pretty quickly because um, you know you're all here to see Russ. But I just want to remind everybody that I'm going to be sending out all those links to the programs I just talked about and the slides. So you know, don't worry if you didn't uh, catch everything or write everything down. Uh, I'll be sending that out via email to everybody that registered. So without further ado, uh, Russ, please take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Kellen. Um, I'll go ahead and leave my camera on because I like to talk with my hands and make funny faces and stuff like that. But Kellen and Julie, if it starts to affect my audio quality, let me know and I can turn the uh, turn the video off and save some bandwidth. So awesome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so this class is called Heat Pumps for Residential Space Heating and Cooling. Uh, it was originally uh, hosted by Sonoma County uh, Energy and Sustainability uh, Division and you know, they're part of Bayron and all the Bayron folks like to help each other out. So here we are. Uh, the agenda for today is we're going to do a little introduction and then we're going to talk about some terminology, basic terminology to get you straightened out on on all the, you know, BTUs and cooling load and heating load and all that good stuff. And then I'm going to try not to bore you to death, but um, I'm afraid I have to talk a little bit about thermodynamics and the refrigeration cycle in order to really appreciate what heat pumps are all about. So we'll go through that. And then we're going to talk about the advantages of heat pumps for space heating. And then we're going to talk about the different types of heat pumps for space heating. And then we'll talk about the importance of sizing them correctly. As, as Kellen mentioned, that's really, really important. You really want to uh, reevaluate your house before you put a heat pump on it and look for opportunities to improve your house before you put the heat pump on it. Okay, there's, there's two sides to the equation. And most HVAC contractors only see the side that addresses the equipment, but a true home performance contractor will also look at the house and say, you know what, if you seal your house and add some insulation in the attic, you can get by with a much smaller piece of equipment. And that's the right way to do it. That's really how you should do it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then at the very end, we'll have some time for an open Q&A discussion. So my name is Russ King. I'm a licensed mechanical engineer in three states. Um, most of my career was residential HVAC design. I've designed several thousand uh, HVAC plans and they were put into tens of thousands of homes all, all out of California, Nevada, a few in Texas and Colorado. And um, so a lot of houses out there have my designs in them and I'm, I'm not getting phone calls, so that's a good sign. Uh, but I, I was really fortunate that a lot of the designs we did, we had people that would go out and test them. And so I got wonderful, wonderful feedback 
um, on the designs that I did. And that, that really helped a lot. I'm currently uh, working for myself. My son and I have a company called Coded Energy. Uh, we're the developers of Quick Model 3D, which is a, a new 3D HVAC design software. It does low calcs and duct design in 3D. Um, I've been doing this for 35 years. My first job out of college in 1988 was doing energy compliance calculations and building energy simulation models. And my, my boss was a mechanical engineer and I followed his footsteps and he mentored me and I became a mechanical engineer and he taught me how to do mechanical design uh, way back in 1980. Uh, feel free to send me emails if you have any questions about what we talked about today. My, my email's right there, russ at codedenergy.com. And then if you're really interested in HVAC, check out my blog. I, I, it's where I get stuff off my chest when, when, when I need to uh, sort of vent about a particular topic or if I really want to explain something in detail and I didn't have time to do it in a class. I'll usually write an article and say, hey, go check out my, my, my blog article about where you should put ceiling registers in a room or, or why you should uh, have... Um, um, why you should not have a return in every bedroom and things like that. So check that out when you have a chance. So let's talk about heat pumps for space heating. Uh, if you came uh, a week ago, we had a class on heat pump water heating, and there's a few slides uh, um, shared from the two presentations. So you might see a few repeats if you were here last week. Um, but we're talking about space heating, the house, making the house comfortable, okay? To really appreciate heat pumps, you got to understand why we heat and cool our house and how we heat and cool our houses, okay? So the main reason we heat and cool our houses is to stay comfortable. But what does that mean? That means we want the indoors to be a certain temperature and stay at a certain temperature when the outside is doing whatever it's doing, right? So we're maintaining a temperature difference between the inside of the house and the outside of the house, and we want the indoor temperature as much as possible. Okay, and then in some extreme climates, health and safety is an issue. Um, I've done a lot of design in Las Vegas, uh, big production home builders, and um, Las Vegas was the very first city that I ever encountered that required a mechanical plan for a new house. Most building departments do not require a mechanical plan that shows the ducts and everything, and Las Vegas was the very first city that I encountered that did that. And when I asked them why, and they said, because if we don't, people are going to die out here in Las Vegas if their air conditioner doesn't work. They were building a lot of um, retirement communities and senior citizen communities and things like that in Las Vegas. And it gets hot as heck out there. It gets 115 degrees is their, is their summer design temperature, I believe. And um, <clears throat> So it's a health and safety. They want their air conditioners to work correctly. Um, and then, you know, I can make a house built out of cardboard comfortable. If you show me a house built out of cardboard, I can design a system that'll keep that house comfortable, but it will use a ton of energy. It will not be efficient, okay? So using too much energy causes all kinds of negative impacts. So we wanna heat and cool our house, houses and, and use as little energy as possible when we do that, okay? That's kind of obvious, um, but there's a lot of reasons to do that. And, and I'm sure you guys all know those reasons, but we wanna do it as efficiently as possible. And heat pumps are a great way to do that. Okay, so HVAC, you hear that term all the time. That stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, okay? We're going to talk about the H and the AC, not too much about the V today. That's a whole topic unto itself. V is a very important letter in the HVAC world, um, but it's a different topic, okay? We're mainly going to talk about heating and cooling our house, temperature control. Ventilation is an indoor air quality issue. So the main goal of an HVAC system is to maintain a constant temperature in a house, all right? Houses lose heat in the winter and gain heat in the summer. So the heat flow is the opposite direction and it's all about where is it hotter and where is it cooler. Wherever it's hotter, the heat is gonna move from that place to where it's colder. BTUs are antisocial, they don't like each other. BTUs are a unit of heat. And if there's a lot of them in one place, they go, hey, look over there. There's not as many. Let's go that way. And they'll keep doing that until there's the same number of BTUs in both locations. And then it stops. They equalize. All right. So, so heat will naturally go from where it's warmer to where it's colder. In the winter, the BTUs are inside the house and they're escaping. In the summer, the BTUs are outside the house and they're finding their way in. And we got to stop that. We got to stop that movement of BTUs or at least counteract it as much as we can, okay? 
So terminology, BTU, what the heck is a BTU? Well, it happens to be about the same amount of heat that's stored in a wooden kitchen match. So you take a wooden match, you strike it, you let it burn all the way down, you just release one BTU of heat into the air, okay? Now we measure heat movement as a rate of heat transfer, and we call that BTUs per hour. So how many kitchen matches are going from over here to over here in one hour? And we that's how we measure a rate or movement of BTUs. So air conditioners are rated in BTUs per hour. That's how many BTUs they can remove in an hour. Furnaces and heaters are measured in BTUs per hour. And that's how many BTUs they can provide in an hour, okay? Think of those kitchen matches. How many kitchen matches can they, can they provide? So in the next few diagrams, um, we're gonna talk about heat transfer and this little flying kitchen match represents a BTU. So another question we get all the time is, why do air conditioners come in sizes called tons? I got a two ton air conditioner, I got a three ton air conditioner. Well, it has nothing at all to do with the weight of the equipment, okay? I have a friend who's an HVAC contractor and he said one time, uh, Homeowner called him up, said they need a new air conditioner. He said, okay, do you know how many tons it is? And he says, okay, hold on a second. And he goes outside, comes back, and he goes, heck, it can't be more than a couple hundred pounds. And so he he picked it up, tried to lift it to see how many tons it was. So that's not what it means. What it means is way back, it's an old, old term. Way back in the day, we cooled things by buying blocks of ice. Okay, if you're in the in the Bay Area, they would send trains up to Truckee Lake in the wintertime, and they would cut out these giant blocks of ice. They'd load them on a train full of hay and insulated with hay and straw, and they they drive it all the way down to San Francisco, and they would still be not completely thawed out, and they would sell those blocks of ice by the ton, okay? Well, a ton of ice has a cooling capacity of about 12,000 BTUs per hour. So it takes 12,000 BTUs to melt a ton of ice in one hour, all right? So that's what the word tons mean. The tons represents the cooling capacity, so it's about 12,000 BTUs. So when you have a two-ton air conditioner, two times 12,000 is 24,000. That's how that's the cooling capacity of that air conditioner. So when they manufacture air conditioners, they shoot for those 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 steps. They shoot for two tons. They shoot for two and a half tons. They shoot for three, three and a half, four and five. Okay, and so that's what it means. All right, but that's it's important to realize that that's nominal capacity. That's the that's what we call that, that air conditioner. We call it a 410 air conditioner. What it actually gives you depends on a lot of things. It depends on the operating conditions, depends on indoor temperature, outdoor temperature, all these other things. So a two-ton air conditioner may only really give you 18,000 18, BTUs because there's a bunch of things happen to it, okay? Things affect its ability to cool. So be aware of that. There's nominal capacity and there's design or actual capacity, okay? so. When we talk about a cooling load on your house, that means how much cooling does it need to stay comfortable? And that's a calculation that we can do to the house. So in the summer, the BTUs are more concentrated outside. So they're naturally coming into the house in a variety of ways. And the cooling load is a calculation of the number of BTUs per hour that are coming in, all right? You can calculate that by the square footage of the walls, the kind of walls, the windows, what direction the windows are facing, the ceiling insulation, all that stuff gets added together and you add it all up and you say, okay, on a design day, when it's this temperature inside, this temperature outside, there's this many BTUs per hour coming into the house. And that's called your cooling load, okay? Then the next step is to pick an air conditioner that will meet that load, that will provide enough cooling capacity to meet that load, okay? So cooling is the process of removing heat. So now we need, this, these BTUs are coming in and we need to remove those BTUs, okay? In a, a, a two-ton air conditioner, nominal two-ton that has about 20,000 BTUs of cooling, that means it can remove 20,000 kitchen matches worth of heat out of the house in an hour, okay? Heating load, same exact thing, except the heat is moving in the opposite direction. So now it's warm inside the house and it's cold outside the house and the BTUs wanna naturally go to where there's less BTUs, and we can calculate that. We know the delta T, the difference between the inside and the outside. We know the, the, the R value of all the walls and the ceiling, the floors and windows and everything. We know the areas, we can add those all together. We can calculate a, B, a BTUs per hour, okay? And then when we heat the house, we buy a heater 
that provides at least as many BTUs per hour as we calculate that are needed, all right? So it's very, very important to know what the house needs, all right? Um, to maintain a constant temperature in the house, whatever we want it is, I'm going to say 70 degrees in the winter and 75 in the summer. Okay, that's actually code specified design temperatures. That's what we design it to, that code requires it. Now, you may want to keep your house at a different temperature than that, and that's fine. And you should be able to do that. If there's any excess capacity at all, you should have the ability to make your house cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Uh, but that's what we're required by code to design. It's actually 68 in the wintertime. Uh, but I like to just say 70. Okay? Um, and then 75 in the summer. So if we want to maintain those temperatures, if the, if the heat is leaving, we need to replace it at at least the same rate that it's leaving if we want to keep that same temperature. All right. And then in the summer, the BTUs are coming in and we want to remove the heat at at least the same rate that it's coming in. So always think of it in terms of heat moving. Heat is coming in or heat is going out. We don't put coldness into a house. We remove the heat. Okay. So the capacity of the equipment is what the what the equipment gives you. Think of that as the supply. We've got a supply of something. And then the house is the load of the house is what the house needs. That's the demand. So we've got a supply from the equipment and the demand from the house. If you don't measure the demand first before picking a piece of equipment, you're not doing it right. Okay. And don't go by what's currently in your house. That is probably wrong. Most homes in California, the equipment is oversized. And that's not a good thing. And what tends to happen is a contractor will come out to your house and say, oh, what do you got in there now? Oh, 310? Great. That's what we'll put in. That's maybe not the best thing to do. Okay. That 310 could be oversized. And by doing a low calc, you may see that by doing some minor things to your house, you can make that equipment work just as well and be much smaller and save money. Okay. Um, so there you go. It's very important to do a load calculation. Good equipment sizing is the ability to match the equipment supply to the house's demand, okay? Not too big and not too small. If your equipment's too small, we call that undersized. If you undersize equipment, you know what's going to happen. On really, really, really cold days, it won't keep up. On really, really hot days, it won't keep up. But what about the rest of the year? The rest of the year, it's fine. It's only not working on the really cold or really hot days. If you oversize equipment, the equipment's capacity is much bigger than the load, that causes comfort problems, and it's even worse on the mild days than it is on the extreme days. Your equipment might work fine on the extreme days, but then be oversized on the mild days. So it's actually better to undersize it. If you had a choice, it's actually better to undersize equipment a little bit than it is to oversize by a lot, all right? So, but you don't know unless you do a load calculation. So undersizing is defined as when the capacity of the equipment is less than the load of the house. And remember, the load is, is calculated at certain temperatures. And when the temperatures aren't that extreme, it should work fine, right? But if you oversize or if you undersize, it'll work fine on those mild days, okay? So if it's undersizing, the demand is greater than the supply, and it won't keep up, okay? And that's what most people think is wrong with their, their systems. In reality, what might be wrong with their system is it's actually it's oversized, and that'll cause a lot of comfort. Oversizing is defined as when the capacity of the equipment is substantially higher than the load. You've got more capacity than you need. The supply is much greater than the house, and this causes a lot of comfort issues. Okay, I don't have time to go into those in detail, but the, the main one uh, is called short cycling. When your equipment is too big, it runs for very short periods of time and it blows really hot or really cold air for a short period of time that never lets the house mix. It never lets the house, the thermostat sense all the rooms in the house and it shortens this equipment life. So there's a lot of problems associated with oversizing equipment, but it's human nature to play it safe, to want to round up a size, to play it safe when you actually should be looking for excuses to make the equipment smaller. Things like how do we remove, how do we reduce the load of the house so we can make the equipment small, okay? And I mentioned outdoor design temperatures. We are required by code 
to specify a certain indoor temperatures, that's the 68 in the winter, 75 in the summer, and then we're required to do our load calculation at certain outdoor temperatures. And those come from a table, all right? They're not the worst temperatures ever recorded in the city. In fact, if you go and look at the design temperature for a city that you live in, you might say, man, that seems kind of low, or summer, summer design temperature. You might say, man, that seems kind of low for my city. I remember last time it got a lot hotter than that. That's okay. We're designing for a certain case, and your equipment is usually going to round up to the next size. you got a little excess capacity, but your house doesn't experience the same load that you do when you step outside and you feel that's 100 degrees. Well, it hasn't been 100 degrees for very long, so your house is lags behind the actual outdoor temperature. It's called thermal mass, okay? So it can actually get really hot outside, and your house never even knows it, okay? It depends on how long it stays there. So when they say, yeah, it hit 100 degrees in San Francisco, okay? it didn't hit 100 degrees for a long time. It just peaked at 100 degrees. And 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 so anyways, so oversizing is not good, not good. All right. So the systems need to work on the mild days. It's mild more than it's extreme, all right? So we don't want to design to the extreme days and, and then not have it work on the mild days, which is most of the time. So oversizing will cause more heat comfort problems than undersizing. And like I said, short cycling is, is the main issue. It'll, it'll cause comfort issues. It'll shorten the life of the equipment. Like if you drive your car and sh turn it off, you drive your car and turn it off, drive your car and turn it off, your car won't last as long as if you go a nice steady speed the whole time. All right. Um, and, then, and then having bigger equipment uses more energy to accomplish the same job that a smaller piece of equipment would do. Okay. All right. Here we go, super basic thermodynamics and the refrigeration cycle. So think of all, think of temperature as measuring the density of BTUs. Okay? If you've got a room and it's hot, there's a lot of BTUs in there. And if you wanna cool the room down, you remove some of the BTUs from that room, from that volume, that space, okay? And it's how dense the BTRs, BTUs are in that space is what makes it hot or makes it cold, all right? And the other thing you realize is, Everything has some BTUs in it. Even a block of ice has some BTUs in it. The only place where there's no BTUs is out in the vacuum of space, okay? On this planet Earth, everything has some BTUs in it. And how do you get those BTUs? Remember, BTUs want to move to where there's less of them. So if we want them to move, we present them with a place where there's less BTUs that's colder. And the BTUs will naturally hop onto that place that's colder. All right, so when we heat something, we're adding BTUs to it, we mentioned that. When we cool something, we're removing BTUs from it, All right? So if we want BTUs to go from this block to another block, we make that other block colder, put them in contact, and the BTUs will jump on that other one. If we want BTUs to jump back to this block, we make it colder, put them together, and the BTUs will jump back to that one. Okay, it's all about putting BTUs where they need to be, All right? So, if you remove BTUs at the same rate at which they're coming into the house, we can maintain a constant temperature, okay? BTUs naturally move from higher temperatures to lower temperatures until they equalize. And we call that the second law of thermodynamics. So you've got these two blocks of metal. The one on the, on the right has more BTUs in it than the one on the left. We put them together and the BTUs move from where there's more of them to where there's less of them. And they'll keep doing that and doing that until it equalizes temperature. And then the BTUs will say, hey, there's the same number of BTUs on both sides. We have no place to go, all right? The other interesting thing is you can change the temperature of something, not by changing the BTUs, but by changing its volume. So if BTUs are the density of BTUs in a volume, if you make the volume bigger, you've made the density less, which means you've made it colder. And if you compress it, you, the BTUs are closer together and they're more condensed and you've made it warmer. So by, by compressing and, and, and um, expanding and compressing a, a gas, let's say, you can make that gas hotter and colder without changing the number of BTUs in it, which means if you can make it colder than the air around it, it will absorb BTUs. And if you squeeze it and make it hotter than the air around it, BTUs will want to leave, all right? So 
a volume of compressible fluid can have its temperature reduced by expanding it to a larger volume. And let's say you're in a 70 degree room and you expand that container and make it 40 degrees inside that container, the BTUs will go from the 70 to the 40. So they'll go inside the container, right? And then you squish it down until it's 100 degrees. Now it's hotter than the air. Now it wants to leave the BTU, leave the container. So we basically have created a BTU sponge, okay? If we expand it and it's colder than the air around it, it will absorb BTUs. If we take it somewhere else and squeeze it and make it hotter than the air around it, the BTUs will leave. So we can expand it, squish it, expand it, squish it, and move BTUs from one place to the other. So the ability to mechanically change the temperature of a fluid by changing its volume is a very important concept in understanding air conditioning and refrigeration. Let's say we have a house at 70 degrees and it's 90 degrees outside. So the BTUs are gonna to wanna to come into the house naturally. And if we didn't do anything at all, we just left it alone, eventually the house will become 90 degrees. All right, but we don't want that. We want it to stay 70 degrees inside the house. So we got, as the BTUs are coming into the house, we gotta get them out of the house at least at the same rate. So it stays the same temperature. So we can do that. We have this canister we expand it till it's 40 degrees and, and absorb some BTUs and then go outside and squish it to make it hotter than the outside air, the BTUs will leave. And if we go back and forth, squeeze it, absorb it, squish them out outside, absorb them inside, squish them out outside, absorb the inside, squish them out the outside. And if we can do that fast enough, we can, we can keep up and keep it 70 degrees inside the house. Well, the only way to know how fast to do that is to do a load calculation on the house, to do a calculation and estimate how many BTUs are coming into the house. And then we can decide whether we can, our sponge will work fast enough, how fast we have to squeeze and expand in order to get the BTUs to leave. Okay. So we have just mechanically moved BTUs in the opposite direction that they want to go. They want to come in and we can move them out at the same rate by mechanically expanding and compressing this gas, all right? Spoiler alert, we can go the other direction too. What I just described is air conditioning. It's hotter outside, cooler inside, and we're keeping the house cool. That's air conditioning. What if we wanna keep the house warm and it's colder outside? We can do the exact same thing. We just gotta make the gas colder than the outside air so that it absorbs BTUs, bring it in the house and squeeze it till it's hotter than the inside air and BTUs come out, all right? So we can do it in the opposite direction. So, nope. instead of using a vessel and having to squish it and expand it and squish it and expand it, go back and forth and back and forth, some very, very smart people decided instead of using a container, let's use a molecule. Let's use a little tiny molecule that expands and contracts and absorbs heat. And let's put them inside a tube, lots of these molecules, and then you have a loop where on one end of the loop, they expand and on the other end of the loop, they contract and absorb heat. And then they go back to the other side, expand it. And we have this constant conveyor belt of little teeny tiny BTU sponges taking BTUs out and it works wonderfully. Okay, that's called a refrigeration cycle. And, and it will absorb heat from your house from your relatively cool house, because we make the, we make that gas cold, we take it outside and make that gas hotter than the outside air and the BTUs come out of it. So we're pumping BTUs out of the house. And the same thing works in the winter time. We absorb BTUs from the really cold air by making the gas colder than the outside air. It absorbs BTUs. We bring it inside and we squeeze it until it's hotter than the inside temperature and the BTUs come out. All right, so it's a heat pump. It's going the other direction that, that we normally think, right? So what is a heat pump? Why is it so special? What's special about heat pump? Well, they're all electric, which is good because electricity can come from renewable sources. If you have a solar panels on your house, it's a no brainer. You you own your own electric company. Why would you want to buy gas from the gas company when you own your own electric company? And then the, the grid is improving all the time, more and more. Uh, renewables are coming online all the time, so electricity is is a good way to go. 
then rather than using electricity to create heat, which is what electric resistance heaters do, okay, electric resistance is the good old, you know, the old spiral electric stove top that we used to have back in the day. You turn them on, they start to glow red. That's electric resistance heating. Your blow dryer is electric resistance heating. Most any plug-in heater is an electric resistance heater. Electric resistance is very efficient. Okay, it's about it. It's 99.5% efficient. Just call it 100% efficient. So if you take five BTUs worth of electricity and you put it through an electric resistance heater, you'll get five BTUs of heat out of that. That's very efficient. How can you beat that? How can you possibly beat 100% efficient? Well, by using that mechanical thing that I talked about, that mechanical compression and expansion, that mechanically moving BTUs, BTUs or heat pumps actually cheat. You could say BTUs uh, are stolen. <laughs> heat pumps cheat. They don't create heat. They move heat that already exists. As it turns out, it takes about one third the amount of heat, or sorry, one third the amount of electricity to move BTUs than it does to create them. So BTUs can be moved from one place to another at one third the where heat pumps can be up to 300% efficient. That's amazing. That is truly amazing that, that we're, you, we're capturing heat that already exists and we're putting it inside the house for one third the electricity that it would take to run an electric resistance heater and do the same thing. Okay, so now heat pumps can compete with gas on an economic basis. With electric resistance heaters, they, they couldn't, even though they were 100% efficient, a B2 of electricity costs so much more than gas that they weren't cost effective. But now we've got heat pumps, okay? We've had heat pumps for a long time, but they've improved a lot in the last few years. The first house my wife and I bought back in 1988, uh, actually we bought it in 89, um, had a heat pump in it. So they've been around for a long, long time, but they've improved greatly over the last few years. The compressors, the controls, the variable speeds, all this other stuff has made them much, much better and they work at much, much colder temperatures too. So what are the advantages of a heat pump space heating over gas? Well, air conditioners have been around since the 1930s. They're a proven technology. Air conditioners move heat from the inside to the outside. Heat pumps just go in the other direction. Heat pumps are air conditioners that run backwards in the wintertime. Heat pumps, um, we like to say, if you buy a heat pump, you get a free air conditioner with it. Okay, it's the same piece of equipment. It just runs backwards in the summer to cool the house and runs back the opposite direction in the winter to heat the house, okay? How cold can it be before a heat pump will start working? When do, are those BTUs so less dense that the BTUs can't be absorbed in? Okay, well, it has to be pretty, pretty darn cold. What's the coldest freezer you've ever seen? The coldest chest freezer, hasn't been defrosted in a long time. The, the sides are all covered with frost and there's a half gallon of ice cream in there that's so cold, it's rock hard and you have to put it in the microwave before you can scoop ice cream out of it. That's a heat pump. And if a heat pump can extract heat from that cold of air, it can certainly extract heat from the outdoor temperatures there in Marin County, okay? It would have to get pretty darn cold. I'll tell you, I know people in Alaska and I know people in Minnesota, I know people in Pennsylvania, that have heat pumps on their house and they work great. If they can work there, <laughs> they can definitely work in this cream puff climate that we have here in Northern California, trust me. All right, heat pumps um, are being successfully installed, installed in some of the coldest regions of the world. I mentioned that they're ideal for the Bay Area climate. You can put supplementary electric resistance heat for those extra cold nights, but if you size your heat pump correctly, you don't need it. You do not need electric resistance strips if you size your heat pump correctly. How do you size your heat pump correctly? Load calculations. You have to do a load calculation. Heat pumps can have backup electric resistance for emergency purposes. They need to have controls on them so they don't come on when they're not supposed to. So the advantages, the main advantage to me is heat pumps are safer, okay? To me, that's the most important thing. I've designed most of my career is designing residential HVAC systems, and I always, always had a problem running gas into somebody's house. Why would we want to pump an explosive gas into our homes that could potentially blow our house up, and then when we use that gas, it gives off poison? 
that's just that's like the most caveman possible thing there is um and but we do it all the time it's just it don't, people don't think about it when you learn about combustion safety testing and things like that you start to realize um look at my little quote down there at the bottom i asked a building department or a building department person a uh, building inspector quoted this one time uh you know a friend of mine got a permit to replace the toilets in his house he got a building permit to replace the toilets in his house they made him put in carbon monoxide detectors for toilets now that you have to have pretty bad digestive problems to require a carbon monoxide detector because you replace your toilets that's not why they require it the reason they require carbon monoxide detectors no matter what kind of permit you get on your house is because they know that carbon monoxide is a serious serious problem and you must if you have gas water heating or gas spacing in your house you absolutely positively have to have carbon monoxide detectors it's a no-brainer and i would go on to say even better than a carbon monoxide detector is a carbon monoxide monitor okay the difference is, is a monitor will tell you on a numbered scale how much carbon monoxide it's detecting. So it will show you when it detects low levels and they'll show up on your on the screen, but a carbon monoxide uh, detector will only go off when it reaches a certain level, okay? So carbon monoxide monitors as opposed to carbon monoxide detectors. All right, so what's the problem with gas? Well, it blows up, okay? With heat pump, there's no explosion danger. There's no poisonous gases coming off of the unit and there's no fire hazards, okay? Have you ever noticed that if you have a gas water heater in your uh, in your garage, it has to be raised 18 inches up off the ground. Why is that? Because people put gas cans on the floor and that gas runs along the floor and could potentially explode. You don't have those problems with the heat pump, all right? Here's another thing. If you have a gas furnace in your house, okay? Take the front cover off and look inside there you'll see all kinds of wires and switches and tubes and sensors and all this other stuff. 80% of that stuff is a safety device. 80% of what you see is for safety purposes. There's rollout preventers, there's low gas monitors, there's high gas monitors, there's, there's pressure sensors, there's all these different things that if anything goes wrong in your furnace, it stops working because it's a safety thing. Heat pumps don't need that stuff, okay? So that right there should be a big red flag. The other thing, um, builders have been wanting to build electric, all electric homes for years and years and years. They would prefer to build all electric homes. Why? Because it's cheaper and it's simpler to build an all electric home than it is to run gas into your house and put gas appliances in there. So if you don't have gas, you have no gas pipes, you have no flu vents, those big metal vents that come up out of the house, and you have no combustion air vents. If you have a closet with a water heater in it, you'll notice there's grills either into the attic and crawl space or in the door. If your water heater or furnace is in the garage, you'll notice there's these louvered vents to let air come in. That's so the air can come in and let the, let the flame breathe. Those are called combustion air vents. You don't need that stuff for heat pumps. Lower, lower maintenance, okay? Combustion appliances, they get dirty, they get clogged, they get they age, they rust, okay? There's a lot of moisture when gas burns, there's a lot of moisture and that moisture gets inside the unit and causes it to rust. So combustion appliances must be checked and adjusted regularly. Um, heat pumps don't have any gas burners or ports to come clogged or dirty. Um, no safety devices needed in a heat pump. No gas condensate drains or pump outs to worry about, okay? Um, and the other thing is heat pumps come in much smaller sizes, which is nice. If you're building an ADU, the smallest gas furnace that you can buy is way too big. I can tell you that right off the bat, okay? Maybe a little tiny wall furnace or room furnace might work, but you don't want those. That, that just heats the room that you're in. You want a nice ducted system. The smallest gas furnace is too big for any ADU, and most homes is too big for that, okay? So you have better load versus capacity matching with a heat pump. You can buy really small heat pumps, half ton heat pumps for ADUs and stuff like that. That results in a more efficient building and better comfort. The easier zoning, if you have a house and you wanna zone different parts of the house and have it controlled separately, you can do that more easily with heat pumps than you can with gas furnaces. Um, and they're clean, all right? Heat pumps are just cleaner. That should be fairly obvious. 
They're super efficient. I mentioned they're 300% efficient at using electricity to create heat, or actually move heat, sorry, move heat. All right. And they, they're really, really high. They, they, you can control them with your phone, um, all kinds of really neat things going on with them. And they're, they're cost effective. They, they are now can match gas on a, on a cost effectiveness basis. Okay. Uh, of course, that depends heavily on your your rates and time of use and stuff like that, but they absolutely can compete with gas. So um, heat pump heating efficiency, by the way, is rating in something called an HSPF. Okay, HSPF, the higher the better for heat pumps. And for air conditioners, the efficiency rating is called a SEER, S-E-E-R, or E-E-R. Okay. Let's talk about the disadvantages. There are some disadvantages. I'm not trying to uh, downplay those at all. The main, one of the main disadvantages is the equipment's very complicated. It's very high tech. There's a lot of buttons and dip switches and controls and settings and all this different stuff for different combinations. And many HVAC contractors are not good at setting those. Okay. So it does require a more qualified technician, just like cars. You know, it's a lot easier to work on an old 1970 Ford Bronco than it is to work on a brand new one. That's for sure. But mechanics have kept up with that. Okay, and just like cars, mechanics have gotten trained, HVAC contractors are getting trained and learning to, to take care of heat pumps. It gets better and better every day. They do have very complicated controls, okay, and if you don't set them correctly, they'll blow cold air on you and you don't want them to, okay. Um, they can be a bit more difficult to operate by homeowners, but once you get them set, and, and with a lot of the new phone apps, they're, it's very easy and, and, and um, user-friendly, okay. But they do require a little bit more attention. Uh, another big disadvantage in my world is that uh, if you don't design a heat pump correctly, if you don't size it to the load of the house, it, it will cause problems. Okay, They're much more susceptible to improper design than a gas furnace is. A gas furnace is a dumb beast. It just turns on, sends out flame. No matter what's going on, it's just making flame and making heat. Uh, whereas a heat pump, it it's, it's depends on some things, okay? So it is more susceptible. Uh, designers have to be much more careful about load counts and equipment sizing and duct design, okay? Um, these things have been required by code for years and years, but enforcement has not been that good, okay? So it's really up to homeowners to say, hey, if you're gonna put a heat pump in my house, I wanna make sure it's properly designed. I want you to do a load calculation. I want you to do a proper equipment sizing. I want it, I want the ducts to be sized properly. I want good airflow in my house, okay? Uh, it's time contractors start doing what they're supposed to. We need to hold their feet to the fire. They've been lazy. Gas furnaces have made, have made contractors lazy, okay? Uh, and we need to get them to do what they're supposed to do. If a contractor tries to talk you out of a heat pump system, find another contractor. They simply don't know what they're talking about. Okay, there's a lot of contractors out there will say, no, you don't want a heat pump. Let's just go with the gas furnace. And that's because they a, don't know how to do load counts. They don't know how to size them. They've had bad experiences with heat pumps. The bad experiences with heat pumps become or come from bad design and bad installation. It's not the heat pump's fault. Okay, it's the installer's fault. It doesn't work correctly. There are some grid reliability issues. As more and more people switch over to electricity, it puts more strain on the grid, okay? But this has been proving every day. This is proving every day. It gets better and better every day. Making houses more efficient so they will work with smaller equipment can actually reduce the load on the grid, okay? So uh, putting um, switching from gas to electric heating may require upgrading your panel. If your panel was not sized to handle a big enough load, and then you switch from gas to electric heating and maybe water heating, you may have to upgrade your panel. There are some fancy things you can do to avoid that, but there's a lot of rebates and a lot of incentives to help cover the cost of upgrading your panel. And if you're going to upgrade your panel, you may as well go whole hog and say, hey, let's 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 plan on an EV charger, let's plan on a heat pump water heater, let's plan on a whole bunch more electric appliances, just do it now and get it over with, okay? So all the disadvantages that I mentioned about heat pumps are avoidable and improving over time. So heat pumps are just gonna get better and better as we go. If you put in a gas furnace today, you're gonna have to live with that gas furnace for 20, 25 years, okay? 
if you're lucky, if you're not lucky, I should say. Um, I had a gas furnace in my house for 25 years. And when we sold the house, it was running strong, all right? And that's a problem because I guarantee you, long before that 20, 25 years is up, it's going to be almost a no-brainer to switch. It already is a no-brainer to switch to gas, but it's going to be a switch to heat pumps. It's going to be like, you're going to really, really, really wish you hadn't installed that furnace in the few years. So you've heard the expression, uh, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. Same thing with heat pumps. The best time to install a heat pump was yesterday. Right. Okay. Types of heat pumps. Let's talk about some of the options that are available to you. I'm going to spill over a little bit into the Q&A time. I apologize. Um, but um, here we go. So. Heat pumps come in a variety of configurations. Okay? Ducted split system heat pumps have been around for a long time. This is, a, this is an, a diagram of a ducted split system. That means the condensers outside and the air handlers inside. You can buy package units so it's all together. Um, heat pumps have a fan coil unit that looks very much like a furnace. It just doesn't have the gas line going into it. It doesn't have the combustion of fluvent coming out of it. It doesn't have all the safety controls and stuff like that. It's just a big box with a fan in it and a coil. Okay. No gas lines, no flu vents, no combustion air, no safety devices needed for a heat pump. Um, that's, a, that's a standard split system. That's what we had in our first house that I mentioned. They're still available. Um, but there's a lot of new ones out there. Um, you've probably heard of mini split. Okay. You can have single head mini splits or multi head mini splits where the outdoor condenser is controlling more than one head, okay? And then you can have ducted mini splits and you can have ductless mini splits, right? So ductless mini splits, you can have multiple heads. You can also have multiple heads with ducted mini splits, okay? I personally prefer ducted because I like to run ducts in all the rooms and make all the rooms comfortable. The thing about ductless mini splits is they heat and cool the room that they're in really well. But how is that heating and cooling going to get to the room next door that doesn't have a head? You can't put a head in every single room. You can put a head in the main rooms, but there's going to be some rooms that don't have a head. How do those stay comfortable? Okay. I personally prefer ducted mini split, but if you have a really efficient shell, if the envelope of the house is super efficient, you can put a ductless mini split in one end of the house and the whole house will stay comfortable if the, if the building shell is really efficient. Okay. But most of them aren't. You need to spread them around, uh, and probably ducting might be the best option. Typical heat pumps that we talk about all the time, they're called air source heat pumps. They make something called a water source or a ground source or a geothermal heat pump. So instead of extracting heat from the air, you pump these, you pump, you bury these pipes deep in the dirt, in the earth, and they bring water up, and it, it, it extracts heat from that water instead of extracting heat from the air. Very, very efficient but a little complicated in installing them because you either have to drill a big hole or you have to dig a great big trench. So you need, you need pretty substantial lot to do that in some cases, um, or, or they're just a lot more expensive, more complicated to install, but they're really, really efficient. Okay? All right, sizing heat pumps. How do we make sure that they're properly sized? Heat pumps provide both heating and cooling from a single piece of equipment. So the, the amount of heating and cooling that comes from that piece of equipment is fixed. The relationship of those two numbers is fixed. You can't, you can't get more heating and less cooling out of, a, out of a unit. You buy the unit and you get this much heating, you get this much cooling. Okay. Um, but depending on your climate, your loads may not match that ratio exactly. Okay. So potentially you could have, you could size your heat pump to the heating and have way too much cooling, or you can size the cooling and have not enough heating. All right, so it's very important that you do a load calculation. Manual J is the industry standard for load calculations, and then manual S is the industry standard for picking a heat pump that will match those loads. Super oversizing or undersizing, okay? And then manual D is the, is the industry standard for duct design. So if you hire a contractor, they need to be proficient in manual J, manual S, and manual D, okay? There's a new version of manual S coming out right now. It's, it's literally going to, they're going to release the, the PDF download any day now, any day. Okay, I know it's behind schedule, so it's supposed to come out any day now. 
uh, and it has a much bigger focus on heat pumps. There's a lot more options and a lot more nuance on how you size a heat pump to your heating and cooling levels. So historically, most designers, most HVAC contractors would come out to your house and say, what size air conditioner do you have? Oh, a 410? That's what size heat pump we're going to put in. And then we're just going to put in a bunch of electric resistance strips to make up any difference between the heating load and the capacity. Okay. That's not how you do it anymore. Okay. Um, research, field studies, and improvements in heat pump technology all show that a heat pump system in 99% in or on 95% of California do not need electric resistance strips. And certainly not in the Bay Area. Okay, maybe in Tahoe, maybe in Truckee, maybe in Mammoth Lakes, maybe in Bear Valley, okay? Um, heat pumps can still work in those places if properly designed and never run on the electric resistance strips, okay? It is possible, but certainly in the Bay Area, you do not need supplemental heating from electric resistance strips. If you can have an emergency heating from electric resistance strips, but there has to be special controls that make those run only in emergency situations, okay? So technically, the uh, general recommendation today is to size the heat pump to the larger of the heating or cooling load. And in Marin County, that's usually gonna be the heating load will be larger than the cooling load. Um, and then it might be a little oversized for the air conditioner, but oversizing can be mitigated um, with good duct design, good airflow will reduce the problems caused by oversizing, and then invest in variable speed equipment. And variable speed equipment can act like a smaller piece of equipment on milder days, okay? So as long as your heat pump heating capacity is properly sized to handle the heating load without heat strips, the heat strip should never come on, okay? Like I said, you can have emergency strips, but if you properly size your heat pump, they'll never come on unless you need them, unless your, your heat pump fails for some reason. You run, into your, you run into your condenser with your riding mower or something like that, and you need heat, um, the electric resistance heat can provide that heat. But there has to be a special switch to turn them on when you need them. So uh, another interesting thing is setting back your thermostat. You don't need to do that with heat pumps. With gas furnaces, you can, you know, Keep your house at 70 and then at night or when you're away, set it to 65 and he, the, the gas furnace will catch up, okay? Uh, you don't need to do that with heat pumps. Heat pumps are so efficient, you just set it at a certain temperature and let it run. If you like it colder at night, you certainly can drop the set up the temperature down. But keep in mind that heat pumps take longer to recover. So you're going to want to have it come back earlier than you otherwise would, okay? But you can still set it back, but you just don't need to. A lot of people, a lot of people set their furnaces back um, when they're not home to save energy. You just don't need to do that. Okay. One of the most common problems with new heat pump systems is the installers aren't familiar with the controls and the commissioning. So when you when you hire a contractor, ask them how many heat pumps they've installed. Ask them for some references. Say you'd like to talk to some homeowners where you've installed heat pumps. Okay. Um, look at their Yelp reviews, but ask them how many heat. What's their experience with heat pumps? Um, they, it's not uncommon that they will install it and you'll say, hey, it's not working correctly. And they'll have to come back and throw some switches and make some adjustments, okay? Just specifically for your house. Heat pumps come with a lot of controls and a lot of installers aren't perfectly educated on how to set those controls for a certain situation. So they do need to try a trial and error, but be patient um, and they'll eventually get it to run. All right, that's it. That's all I have. Sorry, I went six minutes into the Q&A time, and it looks like, Kellen, we've got some questions. Let me open up the Q&A here. So how much electricity, um, KWH, do heat pump coolers and heaters use compared to the terms of gas? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> that depends a lot on your house, okay? So you can convert. Uh, it, you can convert um, watts to BTUs per hour, and you can convert therms to BTUs per hour, but how much they use depends on the house. You need to know the load of your house because it's going to be very different for a big house versus a small house, and it's going to be very different on a, depending on the climate, too. So, that, unfortunately, that's not a not an easier um, easy question to answer right off the bat. You have to do load calculations. 
Uh, can one design the system to keep it at 62 degrees Fahrenheit at night? So we're required by code to um, we're required by code to use certain design temperatures, indoor and outdoor design temperatures. So you're saying, can one design the system to keep 62 at night? So if you're talking about in the winter time, yes, you just turn the thermostat down and it'll keep it at 62 at night, but it's designed to keep it up to 68. But if you're talking about air conditioning, <laughs> if you want it 62 degrees at night during the hot summer nights, uh, that's a different issue. But it'll probably we still work because at night it's not as hot outside and so your air conditioner that's designed to keep it at 75 on a hot day may very well keep it at 62 on a on a cool night okay um but it but it just depends we're when we do our load calculations we have to show them to the building department they're going to make sure we did it at a certain at a certain temperatures and then when we pick the equipment it's supposed to meet those loads but there's usually what happens is the, the equipment comes in these big size differentials and you're going to round up to the next size. And usually that alone will give you enough excess capacity to, to, to be a little more extreme on how you set your thermostat. When replacing a furnace, we are required to do a duct test. If your duct test fails and the ducts are inaccessible, do you have to tear apart sheetrock, et cetera, to fix ducts before replacing a furnace? Um, so that's a, that's a HERS verification question. And the Title 24 Energy Code says that if you do any major work to your heating and cooling system, replace a furnace condenser coil, and that includes a, a heat pump or, or um, a fan coil unit, you're required to seal your ducts. But in an existing duct, some of those are an existing home, some of those ducts are not accessible. So they have a, I call it the I've done the best I can test. <laughs> so it's all about cost effectiveness and if you have to start opening sheetrock and tearing out walls in order to seal your ducts you've just blown a lot of money that you were trying to save by sealing your ducts and so they say if the ducts are not accessible you don't have to seal them but you have to do a smoke test and show that the only leaks that are happening are leaks that can be sealed so if any smoke starts coming through holes in your ducts and you can get to them they have to be sealed there so that rule doesn't change for heat pump Okay, but it to me it would depend on how leaky the ducts were. All right, they did a big study a while ago and they showed that the average house in California the ducts leak thirty percent. So thirty percent of your heating and cooling is going into your attic or your crawl space. That's terrible, and that's why they made this rule. And all they require is that you cut it down to ten percent. So you get it from thirty down to ten percent. But if you can't get it to ten percent and your ducts are still leaky. You're, you can take this, I've done the best I can option and get out of it. But would you really want to do that? It depends on how leaky they are. If your ducts still leaked 30%, I would say, let's open up some sheetrock and find those leaks. All right. So it, it becomes a cost effective issue. But the code does not require that you do that. Okay. Um, let's see. My house has all, I get it, but. I have a 700 square foot house. Yes, tiny, no ducts. Can I put one unit in the ceiling in my central room kitchen to heat and cool left and right? Sure, absolutely. You can put in a, you, they make ceiling cassette units that blow up all different directions. They make ducted units. If you have a little closet or a little hallway, you can drop the hallway, put a ducted unit in there and run ducts to all the rooms. You can put a, um, you can put a ductless mini split on the wall in your main room and it'll heat that in really well, but the question is, will it get into the bedrooms uh, in the evenings? Or you can put it in your bedrooms, but then will it get out to the other rooms? Uh, 700 square feet is probably too small to put more than one head. Uh, you probably only need, need half a ton of cooling. It depends, but you got to do a load count, right? You just have to do a load count and then see, but it's certainly possible to do what you're asking. Yes. Uh, with the major temperature change here in Marin, typically 30 degrees between night and afternoon. Um, I think the rest of that question is going to say. With the I think it's below. Will the heat pump work consistently through 24 hours? I think that's the other half. Okay. So a 30 degree swing between high and low temperatures, yes, it, a heat pump will work fine for that. And if it if it gets to the point where it gets hot in the day and you want air conditioning, and then it gets cold at night and you want and you want heating, you set your thermostat to auto and it will do both of those. 
Yes, it will heat during the day and automatically switch. Or sorry, it will cool during the day and automatically switch to heating at night. You can absolutely do that. Yes. Uh, will the heat pump work consistently throughout 24 hours? Yes. Yes, it can. If designed properly. Okay. What circuit breaker sizes are common for various style heat pumps? Um, I believe 30 amp is typically what most heat pumps require, the 30 amp uh, fuse. Because um, I know that uh, in the new Title 24 code, if you build a new house and you opt to put in a gas furnace, you have to put in electric ready, which means you have to put in the infrastructure to be able to upgrade to heat pumps. And that's a 30 amp fuse, okay? 30 amp breaker. And Russ, um, I have a follow-up to that. Um, so yeah. let's say somebody has a, you know, a central, just a normal central gas furnace. I mean, that thing has an air handler with a fan. What is the like amp comparison there if they wanted to switch that out to a heat pump? The, for the for the fan coil unit, the main reason they want a bigger breaker is is so you can put an electric resistance emergency heat. If you mm -hmm. if you don't do that. Um, I don't think you need to, although they may, I, the fan might be, I'm not an electrician. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, uh, um, the fan itself might be a 220 fan, but it doesn't draw any more power than a, than a, than a gas furnace was. The main reason they want the, the big circuit breaker on the air handle part is for, um, for, so you can put an electric resistance strip. And then the condenser is going to need a, need a, a circuit breaker too. Um, let's see, my house has all double pane windows and the walls and attic are insulated. I guess that if it was needed for my previous question. Oh, okay, yes, yes. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Now the, now the big question is how leaky is your house? Was it ever sealed? Did, it, did anyone ever do a blower door test on your house to measure the infiltration on the house? And maybe that's a big opportunity for improvement as well. Uh, uh, let's see, like that. We have a Munchkin boiler for radiant floor heating. Ah, okay. Uh, the boiler uses a research pump. I would like to replace it with a heat pump. During the summer, the heater doesn't seem to operate too much. During the spring and fall, it doesn't come on too much. It doesn't exceed 85 degrees. Uh, sometimes it exceeds 100 degrees during the, win uh, during the winter or summer. Radiant floor heating was put in mid-century. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Radiant floor heating is wonderful, um, but the really old systems weren't super well designed and some of the materials weren't that great. Um, if you really, really love it, you can uh, lay down new pipes and, and put in another, you know, inches, two, two inches of, of, of um, self-leveling carpet on top of that and do that. They do make heat pumps, water heaters, that are big enough to handle the load. You got to do a load count to, to figure out how big it needs to be. You can, it would be a heat pump water heater to provide the hot water instead of the boiler. And you would probably want that to be separate from the water heater that provides your domestic hot water for showers and hand washing. Um, but the water heater, they do make heat pump water heaters that are big enough to handle the load, the heating load of a house. But you probably want it to be separate. Like that. It's possible. It's possible. It's just, um, you know what all what how much you're willing to spend uh you can run you can run the hot water through the same pipes but chances are your um your pipes are are probably heating the ground as much as they're heating your house uh, um and you want to put slab edge insulation there's a lot of things you can do but it's possible to reuse the existing thing or if you're just not you know you're just tired or you just think there's a better way to heat your house you could put in a forced air heat pump and and heat it like um you know, like like a regular forced air heating and cooling system, and then and then use your radiant floors like supplemental heat if you want to too. So there you go. All right. Hmm. That we need to see. Uh, what if you have small rooms and you want to separate units in each room so you can individually control temperature in each room? I would think the smallest unit would be too big for a small room. Uh, yeah. Generally speaking, that is true, and that's why I prefer um, ducted. Uh, heat pumps is you can you can run the amount of air you need and handle you know a bathroom you keep a bathroom properly conditioned with a four inch duct you know and so the nice thing about ducted systems you can have more even distribution around the, the room and it all depends to like I said on how efficient the shell is like if you were to build a new house today 
and it, you know, it was a passive house and it was super energy efficient and super um, super insulated and super tight. You could put a ductless mini split on one end of the house and it will keep that whole house comfortable because it's preventing the heat from escaping or in coming in. Okay, but if it's an older envelope and an older shell that's leaky and doesn't have the greatest insulation in the world and maybe not the greatest windows in the world, you do want to spread your distribution around um, with multiple heads. But sometimes even that's not enough, and and then you should go to duct the duct. Okay. Uh, got the recordings. There's a couple more in the Q and A oh, box. Just popped up. Okay. Right. Sorry if my sound wasn't loud enough. Uh, let's see. We have a dual fuel system. Okay. Oops. When the outside temperature falls below 40 degrees, our heat pump stops and the gas furnace takes over for heating. Can we eliminate the need for gas heat? Uh, it depends on the size of your heat pump. If you do a load calculation and look at the heating capacity of the heat pump, um, you very well could um, cool it down to whatever the outdoor design temperature, 28, 25 degrees. Um, so you just need a load calculator. That. So, so basically what's happening is you're, your your gas furnace is acting like the electric resistance strips in a in a non gas heat pump system, and uh, coming on when it gets cold outside. Uh, and but if your heat pump is properly sized, um, it it could heat it could heat the house just fine without the gas heat. You would just you would have to do a load calc and look at the capacity of your heat pump to know. And if it doesn't, um, you could you could put electric resistance strips in. Um, and then maybe your heat pump could take you down to 30 degrees and then your electric resistance can could cover beyond that, okay? It just depends. It just depends on the load, okay? But it is possible. Uh, is there ever cost for keeping an existing central AC while adding a heat pump uh, um, to replace gas furnace or heating? Um, keeping an existing central AC. So if you're, what, what some people do is what the, the previous question was about is they is they just keep their furnace and the furnace becomes the backup heat. So the heat pump can hook up to the, the, the coil and the condenser can hook up to the furnace. So your furnace becomes the air handling unit, okay? And then it will act like a heat pump, but when it needs additional heat, the, the gas furnace can kick in and be your emergency heat if you need it. That's great, that's efficient, okay? But in my mind, you're not getting rid of the gas. And the whole reason for me is to get that gas out of the house. So you still have to live with the gas issue. But um, it, can be, it can be a very efficient way to heat your house. And there's, there's some really interesting, um, they call it a, um, um, it's called, it's a balance point, but it's a economic balance point. So at a certain point, it's cheaper to heat with gas than it is with, with, a, with a heat pump. And then your controls can be set to that temperature. Switch like that. That's probably what that 40 degrees was. Yeah, the Russ, just a, that do water and spacing. Yep. Sorry, Rush, just to add on to that, so just a, a policy thing too. So some cities are requiring it when you replace an AC to replace that with a heat pump. Uh, even if the home has uh, existing gas heating. And then so I think the idea is that kind of like um like a phase out, you know, eventually yes. that when the gas goes away. You just have the heat pump that you, you know, installed for right. AC or to replace existing AC. And, and that's kind of how they're trying yeah. to phase out exactly. gas over time and make it as painless as possible. <laughs> yeah. I know that um, the Energy Commission is considering a new requirement for the 2025 code that when, when you replace your air conditioner, if you have a gas furnace and you replace your air conditioner, it's just, just go ahead and replace it with a heat pump condenser. It'll still work like an air conditioner, but you've got that heat pump there. That if you ever want to change it the rest of the way, go go full bore and become full heat pump. Because the difference in price between a heat pump condenser and an air conditioning condenser is not that much. There's just a little there's a little switching valve inside there that makes it a heat pump. And so you can you can you can just install plug in a heat pump condenser to your gas heat and air conditioning system, but then you can it, is, it makes it that much easier to switch later on. So it's interesting what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it says, uh, Chuck says the existing ducting from the furnace is located on the second floor and they run through the attic and down to the second floor and the first floor. Would we have to run new ducting? It depends, it depends. Um, chances are 
the um, chances are your equipment is currently oversized. That would be my bet, okay? And if it is, and you do a load cap in your house, and you find that you can get by with a smaller tonnage heat pump, then the ducts may be properly sized. So it all depends on the size of the ducts versus the amount of airflow that needs to be moved. And the amount of airflow is dependent by the tonnage of the, of the heat pump. So again, you'd have to do a load calc. You have to compare that to the size of the house and then, or size of the equipment. And then you have to say, okay, based on this tonnage, we need to move this many CFM. And then we look at the ducts and, and see, okay? Um, I, I have a, a blog article on my blog, uh, russellking.me. Um, and if you just search for the word evaluate, evaluate, I have a blog article called How to Quickly Evaluate a Residential Duct System. And it helps you do some quick calculations to say, yeah, this, this ducts are, are, will handle this much airflow, okay? Um, are there combo systems that do water and space heating? There are, but... Um, I'm not that familiar with them. Um, that's called combined hydronic, and that's where you have, excuse me, you have one water heater that provides both space heat and um, water heating, okay? But then you need air conditioning on top of that. So if you need air conditioning, um, you know, then you have to have a condenser for that. So um, th it is possible to do it, but it's, it's very complicated put it that way. Um, you'd have to do a lot of research. You'd have to find a contractor who has experience doing that to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, do almost all houses benefit in terms of utility bills if they replace gas burns with a heat pump? Um, it's, I would say most houses break even or come very close to breaking even. Um, it just depends. It just depends on so much. It depends on um, how much gas you use to heat and cool your house. Um, like I said, I would always, always suggest when you switch from gas to, to a heat pump is that you evaluate the house very carefully and see what you can do to improve the house, okay? And, and then you might find that we, you can really reduce the load of the house. And then when you put that heat pump on there, you will come out ahead because now the house needs less heating and cooling. Every house out there can stand some improvement on its heating and cooling loads, okay? Uh, the biggies are um, infiltration, how leaky is the house? If you hire someone to do a blower door test on your house and they come out and they pressurize your house and measure your leakage, and they can find the leaks and they can seal it. Um, every attic could stand to have a little bit more insulation in it. Adding insulation to walls is a little tricky, um, but there's a lot of things you can do to a house to make to reduce the load, and then, then you will come out ahead for sure. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Are there downsides to using a heat pump on radiant floor for air conditioning that was utilized for heating alone? Um, are there downsides to using a heat pump on radiant floor for air conditioning that was utilized for heating alone? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there, Guy, um, but if it, are you talking about a heat pump water heater? What you're saying for air conditioning. So, a heat pump heats the air and cools the air. So that's what you want to do. But if you want a heat pump water heater to heat water to run it through your radiant floors, that's possible. Heat pump water heaters is different. That was last week's class. There's there's water heaters that are heated by heat pumps. And we're talking today about heat pump space heating that heats the air and cools the air. So it will have air conditioning, but it will heat the air and make your house warm by heating the air, okay? So, sorry if I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, Russ, did you see the one about the ADU in the backyard? I just wanna mention that um, our class next, or our, our uh, webinar next Tuesday on kind of electrical panel stuff, we'll, we'll probably cover that in more depth, um, but yeah, I don't know if, another, if you have a response to that. Yeah, that's another one of those, it depends. It depends. You really have to evaluate um, what your current electrical load is. And and I, I come from the HVAC world. And so when I say load calculations, I mean heating and cooling load calculations. But there's also something called an electrical load calculation that looks at your house and sees how much electricity it's going to use. And then you compare that to your panel. And, and Barron's got some really great tools for evaluating that and some great classes coming up. There's some interesting 
um, devices that will allow you to prioritize certain circuits and, and it can help you um, not have to upgrade your panel if you do it correctly. If you're gonna add an ADU, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna have to go to a 200 amp panel, but it depends. <laughs> Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the trainers we're getting, um, you know, I've listened to them a lot and attended some of their other uh, seminars, and they're they're pretty adamant that most homes can completely electrify, including an electric car, um, on the existing panel, which is mostly 100 amps. Um, and and they they get into you know, I mean, even uh, at our last uh, webinar on Tuesday, Sean was basically saying that. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to be too controversial here, but, um, you know, basically uh, electricians, you know, they get paid a lot of money to um, upsize panels and they'll do that for you for money. <laughs> but there are ways yeah. to get around that. And that's kind of what they're uh, what they're trying to do. And um, and, you know, it, it's not just avoiding that cost, which can be, you know, in five and up thousands of dollars. Uh, but if a neighborhood is maxed out on their um, on their load for PG E and the neighborhood transformer gets that needs to uh, be upsized or upgraded, that can add like, you know, at least three months, potentially 18 months to the to that project. So if you can avoid it, um, it's definitely uh, the better way to go. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well I, I take back my earlier statement then about well, let me put it this way. If you do have to upgrade your panel, go ahead and plan for additional things that you may want to do in the future. Yeah, if you definitely. can avoid upgrading your panel, then absolutely avoid it. Um, the question, though, specifically was about adding an ADU. So now you've got a whole other building and a whole other dwelling unit. So um, that's that's going to be a little tougher, I think, because you're, 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 you could potentially be adding a laundry. You could be adding a heat and cooling system and stuff like that. But you never know. It, like it's, yeah, it and I'm not familiar with those, you know, if it's a standalone ADU, like in the backyard, does it even have its own panel at that point? I, I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Um, here's one. Will a home electrification plan help me determine if I have a leaky house or is that something a heat pump contractor does? A uh, really good question. Um, um, yeah, yeah go, go ahead, Russ. I was just going to say, that's something that a, a good home performance contractor will do. And a home performance contractor is basically an HVAC contractor that uh, has learned that it's really uh, beneficial to address the load of the house before you address the heating and cooling system, which means they're looking at the house. You've heard the term, look at the house as a system. That's what they're doing. Um, there's a lot of people, there's HERS readers out there. Uh, there's a lot of consultants who will come out and do a blow door test. There's weatherization contractors that will come out and do a blow door test and seal your house. But there are some HVAC contractors who are home performance contractors who will provide that service as well. Yeah, and, and these are folks that um, kind of, like Russ said, kind of specialize in the whole building and looking at the building as a system. So they probably will offer and recommend, you know, insulation upgrades and stuff like that to go along with their HVAC project. And, um, and yeah, the, one of the programs I mentioned earlier, Home Energy Score, uh, some of the assessors uh, for an additional fee will come out and do a blower door test. The Home Energy Score itself is a visual assessment. So they'll take a look in your attic, they'll kind of, you know, scope stuff out and spec it out um, as best they can and put that all, all that information to a software that spits out the efficiency number. Uh, but you can get a lot more technical with it um, with the blower door because you're actually, you know, and Russ, I don't think you described this, but the blower door is basically just a big fan that goes on the front of the house. They close all the doors and windows and they blow air through it to pressurize the house. And then there's a uh, pressure device called a manometer that measures the pressure inside and outside the house. So it tells you exactly how leaky the house is. And then sometimes contractors will go around with like smoke sticks and see where the air is escaping. And, you know, a lot of the times it's, um, you know, uh, basically anywhere where a hole was drilled for electrical, so like under your sink or, um, you know, your kitchen, bathroom sinks, uh, your wall sockets, um, you know, stuff like that. 
that you know you may not think of but that's all those little holes add up <laughs> to a lot of air they leaking do. out of the house Absolutely. that's why a thousand cuts as they say yeah yep and you know i i, I need to i need to qualify what i'm saying i, I sound like i'm bashing hvc contractors and i don't mean to i i've been dealing and in some cases fighting with hvc contractors my entire career and there are some really 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 good hvc contractors out there i talk to them all the time but they are not the majority. They are not the majority. You've got to search high and low to find a really, really good home performance contractor, which is an HVAC contractor who will do things to make your house better. Um, I used to say a long, long time ago, you know, every contractor has gauges. They have refrigerant gauges. Every contractor has gauges. And I used to say the mark of a good contractor was a, was a contractor that also had a flow hood that measured airflow. And then a few years later, I said, well, now they need a flow hood and a duct tester measure duct leakage and now to me the mark of a good hvc contractor is one that has a blower door if you can find an hvc contractor that owns and uses a blower door that's a really really good sign um great well we're at uh 733 um yeah chuck looks like uh chili's answering that question but um yeah uh again we're going to be posting the videos uh, once we're done with the series next week, I just have to edit them and upload them to our YouTube uh, channel. But I'll, you know, send those out to everybody via email who registered. Um, and next week we have two more on Tuesday night. We're going to have um, uh, making an electrification plan for your home, which is going to be talking about talking about all these electrification projects and how to fit on the panel, uh, your existing panel, and how to know when you actually do need to upgrade to a, you know, 200 or, or higher panel. Uh, Russ, I was just in a, a building department meeting and they're talking about a 600 amp panel that they just saw. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Big house, lots of toys. Um, yeah, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Russ, thank you so much um, for your time tonight. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. And uh, we'll get those uh, slides and materials out to you soon. Um, and like I said, the recordings will probably be available at the end of next week. Um, and yeah, feel free to contact our office with any questions on these projects. We're always there to, to help you guys. You know, we're the county, so we work for all the Marin residents out there. So um, yeah, with that, we'll sign off and everybody have a great night and we'll see you next time.